HBCU game day. I'm Tali Carr in Atlanta. Look, I got I got a trio of people coming to you from Houston right now, and we're going to get into some really serious and important subjects, and I'm really looking forward to it, so let's do it here. Dr. Raquel Burton, Dr. Courtney Flowers, and of course, you know, the dean of the SWAG, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill joining us now. We're talking about HBCUs. We're talking about women's sports. We're talking about Title IX, a lot of things on the table. Let's get started with Dr. Cavill. Uh, Doc, historically, if you look at the context right now, man, we got the NCAA, I don't want to say on trial, but there's an ongoing argument in the Supreme Court about image and likeness and amateurism, and that's something that people have talked about for a long time. We're still dealing with COVID, and we're trying to see how teams, how universities, how programs will be able to rebound as we move forward. We just recently saw it was a big to do and rightfully so the disparity between women's resources at the NCAA tournament with the weight room as opposed to the men's resources and would anything have happened if there was not a stink made about it. So a lot of things on the table, but I think doc you're really good at providing historical context. There's always kind of been a disconnect between HBCUs and the NCAA as an organization as we move forward into a time where they really need to be lockstep if there's going to be equality and moving forward as we rebound from this past year, Doc. Great points. COVID still rules the day. Let's get that out of the way first. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, when you look at the historical framework, you're absolutely right. There has always been uh, this mitigation, if you would, between the associations now as we reference in the NCA, which I think you appropriately said is certainly in a lot of ways on trial in many different ways in the uh, public uh, facets. And in my opinion, many ways they should be on trial. With that said, let's look at it historically, not just starting with the NCA, with the NAIA. Um, at that time, the NAIA was probably bigger, but as we know historically, and some may not know, uh, that African-Americans were not allowed to par participate in the NIA. And NCA. What is even a greater issue to me is oftentimes we look at this in terms of an individual lens, but not an institutional lens, which people don't realize that black institutions, i.e. HBCU, were not allowed in the NIA until the 50s. And then a little later, the late 50s, early 60s, you had the NCA come around. One thing that I've noticed as a historical footprint that I think is important to get out there is the fact that even though the NCA finally allowed participations, and I'm careful to use allow because they fought for it, the inclusion to come into the NCA. There had these funny demarcations, university division, college division, which we see now division two, uh, FCS division one. Uh, as the years would come on, you realize in 1979 when FAMU won the one AA playoffs, which we now call the FCS, that was because there was a further demarcation in terms of division three, division two, uh, division one was split between one uh, AA and one A. So the pendulum always keeps moving the marker. And the last thing I will say historically that's important when we start looking at Title IX and women's sports, the one of the first institutions that allowed um, women to participate as they fought for uh, were HBCUs, specifically with Tuskegee and their women's carnival that had participation of sport. So HBCUs, African American Black people in general, uh, felt the need for inclusion. Now, there were some issues in terms of men's and women's, but generally speaking, that was the framework that I think is important for our followers and listeners to understand. All right, let's bring Dr. Courtney Flowers into the conversation as, as we continue this Texas Southern uh, three-step here. <laughs> uh, Dr. Flowers, when you saw um, uh, the disparity that, that was for everybody to see. It was online. It was social media uh, at NCAA tournament. And we had the, the women's facilities uh, that they set up for uh, them to work out as opposed to the men's facilities. Uh, I, I assume that you, that you saw that like a lot of people. Uh, what, what were the first, first thought that, that kind of ran through your mind when you saw that? Unfortunately, I was not surprised. Um, this is something that's you know, been going on. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we now have social media so people can get that out there. Um, but right now, some of the leading Title IX lawsuits are in softball in regards to facilities. Um, softball players are still fighting for equity. 
in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think social media was a great way just to start the discussion. Um, we saw a lot of people, a lot of my peers uh, that are in sport law to really speak to, you know, what this means. And then obviously having, unfortunately, those athletes have to stop, you know, playing and being celebrated to say, yeah, you know, this is what we got from the NC2A. These are, you know, this is what it looks like for us versus what it looks like for the men. I think it really speaks to and sets up some of the issues we're going to see with name image likeness legislation in regards to Title IX. And that's been a big topic uh, the last couple of weeks is, is the arguments and, and the discussion uh, there for, for the world to see uh, in, in the courts uh, with the NCAA and, and image and likeness. I know we cannot predict what's going to happen, um, but, but what are some of the potential pitfalls um, that if we don't watch and, and, and follow this carefully and, and have some accountability in place, that things might not turn into the, the, the yellow brick road like we assume it could easily do. Yeah, you know what, I'll be honest. When you bring in Title IX discussion to name image likeness, it gets so tricky. Um, we have state legislature that's going on. We have over 30 states right now that have imposed and enacted some sort of pay for play for their states. But there's also federal legislation. And obviously we know with the Austin case going on right now in the Supreme Court, that as well. But I think when we're talking about Title IX, we have to understand that we're talking about the idea of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we're not looking at those opportunities being identical. We're looking at them being equitable. And so in that vein, and, and making that correlation back to name image likeness, there's a couple things that we can assume, but all of this is presumable. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. And so we're talking about the right of publicity. That's what it comes down to. And so when we look at it like that, we can kind of argue some things based on what the NC2A is currently done. Um, name image likeness is basically saying that those student athletes will have the right to get payment from third parties. That's where it gets sticky with Title IX. A lot of people are saying Title IX is not a non-issue, it's a non-issue because of that. If student athletes will be paid by third parties, that takes the institution out. Hence, Title IX is not a factor. However, let's look at the NC2A and let's play devil's advocate a little bit. So let's say that the NC2A and our institutions act like they normally do. Let's, let's give a visual. When we think of men's final four, notice I threw the word men's in. If I just take the word men's out and I say final four, what does your head go automatically? Men, right? We have to say final four and women. And so in that, we can say that the NC2A is promoting who? Men's sports, right? There's going to be a push for women. There's gonna be a struggle for them just to promote themselves. We go on NC2A websites and we see our athletes. Athletes is already synonymous with men. So again, we could say the women again are gonna to have to be challenged in order to get those promotions. Now, in devil's advocate, let's say that for some way, somehow, those institutions have some sort of support, some sort of knowledge in those sponsorship bills. Is there then a need making link back to name image likeness if that institution has knowledge of that sponsorship that that student athlete has or the potential, do they then have the responsibility to make that equitable. And so that's kind of where you have to kind of jump and you have to leap. But there is um, some difficulty in making that leap because the third parties will be involved it's not going to be the institutions that are playing these college athletes It's going to be third parties. Well, I, I tell you what, it, it's funny how, how the, the universe kind of works. It, you know, we're in the middle of this argument. And if you look at this year's Final Four, uh, not to say that the men's side wasn't exciting, but the women's tournament. I mean, raise your hand if that was the most fun. <laughs> I mean, it was something else. So, so the timing of that and the exposure that uh, they organically received just because of the quality of the action out there was really uh, phenomenal. Uh, <sighs> wow, Let, let's talk about student athletes here and, and let's bring in our, our third guest. You know, uh, the SWAC recently 
pass or, or had sponsorship uh, deal with Pepsi that came through. We, we're talking about legislation. I'm, I'm trying to use the verb pass. Uh, they recently uh, completed a, a deal with Pepsi that is going to allow Pepsi to hire a student athlete from each of the SWAC institutions, uh, member institutions, along with sponsorship deal for the uh, SWAC championships in football and basketball. Mm -hmm. How important is a deal like that and how much how many more of those type of situations do we need when you talk about being able to recruit student athletes, not only to talk about uh, having a good time and competing for championships, but also setting them up uh, for professional opportunities? I think that's a game changer for HBCUs. I think that is um, something that can be added to the tool belt to recruit those top athletes that are going to be participating in revenue generating sports because revenue generating sports not only raise the pro raises the profile of those athletes playing uh, in those um, on those on those teams that are you know Roll Tide Alabama you know um, Baylor Baylor Bears think them uh, so it, it, it's gonna it's gonna look at how it's gonna raise the tide of Baylor Baylor is is no longer going to only be viewed as um, a football school, or, nor will it only be viewed as a privileged private white school, right? That's a D that happens to be uh, able to participate in D1 sports. And I think we, we have to look at that because that's very critical in some of the decisions that student athletes make with regard to where they're going to attend college and ultimately give their image, who they're gonna give their image and likeness to. It's a mutually beneficial relationship and anyone that is a thinking person is going to want to be in a situation that is mutually beneficial or at least where they are benefiting um, as well as the, the entity that they're working with. And so, uh, while we know that only a very slim percentage of Division I athletes go on to play in professional sports, but many of them do aspire to continue to be a part of the sport beyond the field and to see those opportunities, and, and especially when those opportunities have a linkage back to the sport, you know, that, that's important to them. And I think that to be able to say, hey, we have these opportunities, we have these partnerships, our student athletes have been able to go into these other industries that still allow them either continued access to the sport and or better opportunities still for themselves and their families. Because also we know that's it. We have to, we have to help our community understand and recognize that white ice is not always better. It's not colder, white ice is not colder. You know, it's just, um, it's just ice, it's the same <laughs> ice. And so we just have to make sure, and I know Dr. Cavill likes that ice reference, but, <laughs> but it is one of, but it, but I do think that that's something we have to recognize that we have to tell our stories and when, when whatever we can add into our arsenal to help us um, promote ourselves and let our student athletes know that you will still have opportunities to be successful. You'll still be able to compete with your peers that are in other division one programs that are not HBCUs. I think it's gonna be, and I'll also add to that, adding that to where we are in this social, in this movement and in this era um, or this moment of recognizing um, inequities bring them more to the forefront in the era of social justice, in an era where people are now um, beginning to know that HBCUs exist and what they stand for and wanting to support HBCUs. I think that th that's a kind of a perfect storm, if you will, for us um, to capitalize on. Uh, and I think we, if we get, are given this opportunity and if we're able to continue adding opportunities such as that, um, I know that even Ford has some opportunities and some partnerships with some with HBCUs, some um, designated HBCUs. We're starting to see that. We're seeing that Major League Baseball is pulling out of pulling the All Star Game out of Atlanta, and it's and it's practice it's political and socially driven, and that's something that we've never seen before um, with corporations and and multi billion dollar industries 
kind of taking those kinds of stands. And I think it's all related. Dr. Burton, this is an interesting thing. I, I thought about you when, when I watched. I, I was at the SWAC tournament in, in Texas Southern, uh, you know, ran through, won that, or won a game in, in the yeah. first four. But, but if you look at that, that starting lineup, you, you look at Weathers and Nicholas and a couple of those other guys, I mean, you know, they started at Stephen F. Austin and these other places, and then they eventually found a home and success at Texas oh, Southern. Yes. How important is it to connect those dots so that we can get those kids right out of high school and not have to have them circle back and find their success at an HBCU? I think that is so very critical. And I think that's why we have to do a better job of talking to those student athletes about our programs and about what our faculty and staff are there for. In, in terms of helping you be as uh, successful as possible in the pursuit of, of your goals. And that's something that we see not only with student athletes, but other transfer students as well. That, and, 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 and that's, a, that's a theme, you know, I didn't get this when I was there. This is something that makes my H, the HBCU experience unique is that additional support and also the accountability that's there um, out of love and concern and not accountability to further punish and disparage, right? And so I think that um, we, we have to, and, and because I hear, I, I hear parents, I'm, you know, have friends and colleagues that have children that are in high school, um, college age, and they say, well, it's all about the money. You know, we're going to go where whoever gives us the most money. And I think that that is the most misguided, you know, way of making a decision. Um, even with college, yes, uh, funding is important. Financial aid is critical. But um, what good is it if it's if your total well-being is not being attended to, or at least concern a concern? Um, where are you going to be able to know that I'm here? Um, for these that the faculty and staff here love me. They care about me. Everything is not perfect, but the concern and genuine interest in the student's success is there beyond the students being a number. Okay, beyond the students coming, be, you know, so those are things that I think are, are, are very important. So I, I, I think that you, we, we've seen that and I think that that's becoming more prevalent and I, I you know, I welcome that. I welcome them and I, but I also think that you're absolutely right that we have to be a first choice and not a second choice. We, we, we have to use these opportunities to articulate and let students and their parents know. Because a lot of times, parents in the communities, they are in support of what they see as success. And if what they see as success is what they're seeing in media. And what they're seeing in media, and I'll use myself as an example. When I go home, I was born and raised in Mobile, Alabama. Roll Tide, but I only say Roll Tide just because it, but when I'm at home, it's annoying because the most of the people that are saying Roll Tide have never set foot on that campus. And, and in many instances, other college campuses and, and, and don't know that we, we had to fight. And I don't, I just think it's, there's something about going where you're wanted versus going where you're tolerated or where you're being used. And I think that we, we, we have to be able to tell that story, but also go beyond what we offer in that um, social and cultural and supportive role, but also what we're able to offer in the classroom, you know, and beyond the classroom. And these partnerships and, and relationships are critical to that. Um, I think that the, that SWAC and HBCU schools can do a better job of collaborating together um, to fight for some of these opportunities and partnerships that will benefit not only the student athletes, but as a byproduct, the, the you know, the other, the other areas of the institutions because the profiles are going to be raised. And that's what happens. Look at Gonzaga. 25 25 years ago, nobody heard of Gonzaga, even if you knew who John Stockton was. You didn't know anything about Gonzaga unless you were listening to him being introduced or reading about him in a program. But look at where they are now. We no longer see them as a Cinderella. You know, we no longer see, they're no longer that Cinderella story. 
and and that's and and people are now I would be interested to see you know I'm sure their enrollment has just gone above. Okay, so I understand. We, back home, we, we call them Walmart fans. I'm I'm from North Carolina. And, yes. And, you, <laughs> wait. Oh, so yes, I was home with my mother. She had surgery, and I just in I'm silly. Doctor Cavill knows that about me. Doctor Flowers is learning that about me. So I said, okay, let's when we go in here, you know, let's see how many, uh, how how many steps we can take without seeing something Alabama or Auburn. Mm -mm. And without seeing, and it was like, I gave up after 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Walmart thing. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. It, it, it's, a, it's a national phenomenon with college athletics all across yes. the country. Uh, we, we've had Dr. Cavill in front of a microphone for, for more than 15 minutes without saying a word. Uh, that, I think that we're gonna have to call Guinness uh, for the Book of World Records. I know that has, has never happened. <laughs> Uh, so, so good doctor, I'm gonna let you bring us home here on this conversation today. Uh, we're, we're all talking about stimulus in our personal life and, and the STEMI checks and, and rebuilding our economy uh, in light of the pandemic. A, a lot of NCAA institutions as we go forward are gonna be in a need of, of a stimulus because of things that have been lost. What are your concerns about HBCUs in this process uh, maybe not getting everything that they need, that they need. Good Lord. I, I don't want to get off the rails, but I just saw the thing about Tennessee state the other day and how they've lost out on hundreds of millions of dollars over the last 100 years, uh, that the state of Tennessee just kindly overlooked, uh, with, with their land grant status. Uh, what are some things you might be concerned about or, or looking at moving forward as we, we try to rebuild as we hopefully get back to something close to, to normal? Well, we talked about equity all over the show. And I think one of the things that we really need to consider is equity in regards to institutions. Yes. Uh, we tend to look at equity between individuals, gender equity, and those are certainly important, but it is the institutions that have allowed this country to grow. And we tend to not recognize institutions a lot of times in terms of this ethnic space, black institutions, white institutions, and beyond that, specifically, historically, of note is those two. So when you talk about the uh, deprivation of resources that HBCUs as black institutions have lacked over the years, it is extremely important. And so as we go through this, we certainly, and I'm one that champions college athletes in regards to the free open market system. If we're in a capitalist system, I want it to be open in terms of capitalism for everybody, not just when it sits in institution uh, for the benefit of what that looks like. For example, going back to the Supreme Court case, uh, Justice Alina uh, Kagan was quoted as saying, uh, quote, to fix athlete salaries at extremely low levels for far lower than what the market would set if it were allowed to operate, end quote. That brings on the other issue is the institutions that lay out to build the wealth based on the marketplace of individuals, in this case, college athletes. And we understand disproportionately those athletes that are playing in the money-driven sport, football and basketball. In this case, I would even say men's and women's basketball in terms of the revenue associated off their back that these individuals, these college athletes are not getting. And that is fixing the system. Whether it's individual or institutional, that is a major problem. And that is built off the back of African-American communities, African-American uh, Black individuals, and therefore Black institutions, as we said in this context, HBCU. Yeah, there, there's so many things happening here, Doc, that, that are positive. Um, and I, I think it's important that, that we, don't, we don't lose track of, of the shiny things. There's a lot of oh man, the swag's on ESPN, or oh, we're here, we're there. And that's great. And I wouldn't want to poo-poo on that, but we, we have to keep a balanced uh, vision, balanced approach, um, and, and not just settle for, for, for one shiny thing in the basket, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That, that becomes extremely important is, um, you've heard me say on this platform many times and anywhere else people allow me to voice, is you have to know your value. And one of the things over the years, because of the deprivation, because of the social injustices, simply put, the racism that is out there 
over the years, we've been conditioned not to understand our value in the marketplace. And so to reset that and recalibrate that, it's extremely important. And we're starting to see that a lot more, specifically with Dr. Charles McCullen in the Southwestern Athletic Conference and many of the other uh, conferences out there to be a point blank with you in terms of the SIAC and the leadership you see there, CIAA, as well as the MEAC and even the Gulf Coast Athletic Conference in terms of those commissioners and the presidents and chancellors understanding their wealth, their worth, excuse me, and seeking that wealth, I should say, and pushing along with that. So, um, yes, there's the perfect storm, but we need to make sure storms oftentimes can be short unless you're talking about the 40 days or 40, uh, 40 nights. And we need to make sure we extend that to make sure that we push the narrative in such a way that we understand the continued need for the progress of not just uh, African-American Black people or people of color, as some people like the context in terms of minorities, but just individually, but we need to also more importantly understand the value of institutional power. And mm -hmm. so you'll continue to hear me talk about that because that is one of the ways that you truly build wealth if that's what you're seeking in a capitalist society. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Let's, let's not lead a lap and be happy about that. Let's go out and win the race for yeah. sure. Well, one thing I learned in my education at Winston-Salem State University is always leave them wanting more. This has been a great and fun conversation talking about some serious subjects. And I want to extend an invitation for us to do it again. Can, can, can it, look at your neighbor. There's only, there's only four of us. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, let's do it again. <laughs> neighbor, let's do it again. <laughs> neighbor, let's do it again. Uh, and again and again. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Flowers, Dr. Burton, Dr. Cavill, thank you so much for your time. We can't solve it all in one day. There's so much to talk about. So seriously, uh, let's keep this conversation going. And thank you all for your time uh, and expertise today here at HBCU Game Day. Thank you.